Good evening, I'm Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. On behalf of all of my library and foundation colleagues, I am delighted to welcome all of you tonight who are watching our program online. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors, Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. We are so grateful to have this opportunity to explore an important chapter of American history with our distinguished guests this evening. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Larry Pye is a New York Times bestselling author whose most recent book is Demagogue, The Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy. The author of seven other books, he also runs the Boston-based Health Coverage Fellowship, which trains a dozen medical journalists a year from newspapers, radio stations, and TV outlets nationwide. From 1986 to 2001, Ty was an award-winning reporter at the Boston Globe. He has been a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and has taught journalism at BU, Northeastern, and Tufts. I'm also so pleased to invite, to introduce Eileen McNamara, Professor of Journalism at Brandeis University. She's an award-winning reporter and former columnist for the Boston Globe, where she won an individual Pulitzer Prize for commentary and contributed to the newspaper's Pulitzer Prize winning coverage of the clergy sex abuse scandal in the Archdiocese of Boston. Her writing continues to appear there and on Cognoscenti, the commentary pages of WBUR, Boston's national public radio station. She is also the author of Eunice, The Kennedy Who Changed the World. Please join me in welcoming our special guests back to the Kennedy Library this evening. Thank you, Rachel. It's wonderful to be here. And it's wonderful, especially to be here with Larry Tai. Um, some of you watching this program know that Larry and I are reprising a little act that we do every once in a while at the Kennedy Library. Sometimes he interviews me, sometimes uh, I interview him. So tonight I'll be interviewing Larry about his wonderful new book, uh, biography of Joe McCarthy. Um, those of you who have seen us uh, do this act before might not recognize me tonight. Um, I'm rocking my third grade ponytail. Uh, I, would, I thought for a moment I would tell you that I was uh, wearing this hairstyle and these very large glasses in honor of Justice Ginsburg. But I know that this is a much more sophisticated audience than that, and that you will realize immediately that I haven't had a haircut since February. And if I didn't have these glasses on, I couldn't see this computer screen. So here we are. We're going to talk about Joe McCarthy, and we're going to try to put him in historical context. And we're going to try to talk about him in the current moment. Because one of the things Larry tells us straight off in this book is that America has had a kind of love affair with bullies. And I'd like to start, Larry, by asking you, what do you mean by that? So I'm gonna answer your question in a minute, but before I do that, I have to do a quick shout out to Eileen's biography of Eunice. And the I know something about biographies of the Kennedys of that generation, having read a hundred of them, and there is none better than hers of Eunice because She's a great reporter and writer, but more importantly, because she has redefined Eunice as, and makes a very compelling case that she was the most important of the Kennedys of that generation. And for me, that was a little bit hard to stomach when I first heard that was a case she made, but she convinced me, and it is a book that you all ought to go out and buy. If you don't buy any other book tonight, buy her biography of Eunice. So to demagogues- I paid him to do that. <laughs> to demagogues and to um, America's love affair with them. From our very founding days, I think we have had a capacity and an instinct and a terrible tendency to buy into the simplistic solutions that demagogues offer. And whether we're talking about Huey Long, the senator and governor and would-be dictator from Louisiana, or the Jew-baiting 
anti-Semitic radio preacher, Father Charles Coughlin, long before Joe McCarthy, there were demagogues out there that in the style of a demagogue or in a much simpler way of looking at it, in the style of a bully, these were people who bullied the public, who bullied their scapegoats and who offered America simplistic solutions that just didn't wash. There were also a series of demagogues that came after Joe McCarthy, from George Wallace to David Duke. But what I think is different about McCarthy is he is the one who built on all the models of demagogues who came before him, and he created the archetype that to this day set the playbooks for what a demagogue in America was like. And whether it's Joe McCarthy or the movement McCarthyism, when we think of demagogue, he is the poster child for what they have been like. Well, tell me about that playbook. Sure, okay. The playbook is that in lieu of solutions, as I say, demagogues point fingers. When an assailant aims a wrecking ball at them, they attack their assailants twice as hard and below the belt. When one charge against a manufactured enemy is exposed as hollow, the good demagogue, before anybody has a chance to adjust to that, lobs a fresh bombshell. And demagogues, ironically, are created by journalists, and yet when the news gets bad for them and they can't charm the journalists, they attack them. And that is the kind of playbook that McCarthy used to a T. It's a playbook that is familiar to us today, and it is the way that a demagogue defines themselves and the way that America defines the bullies that we call demagogues. I want you to talk a little bit about why that kind of demagoguery takes root in American soil. Because as I was listening to your description, I was thinking this is authoritarianism that you're talking about. But you quoted something in your book, and yes, this is the advertising section of our program. I, <laughs> I subtly reached for his book. Um, and you quoted, of all people, James Fenimore Cooper in your book. And what he says is the true theater of a demagogue is a democracy. I think a lot of our viewers and listeners will be surprised by that. Why does it take root here? It takes root here because... By definition, a demagogue is really brilliant at defining what makes people in a democracy afraid and then finding a way to appeal to that fear and to offer, instead of a solution, a scapegoat. And I want to give you an example of what I mean by looking at Joe McCarthy. America in the 1950s, when he launched his crusade against communism, had real things to be afraid of. We had just watched nationalist China be transformed into what we called red China. We had just watched Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, the atomic spies, be arrested, be tried, and be sentenced to death for passing on our atomic secrets to our arch enemy, the Soviet Union. We were about to do something that Eileen and I may be the only people, and she's probably not old enough to remember this, it's probably just me. We we're about to teach our school children to do something that was famously referred to as duck and cover. And what that meant was when the Soviets attacked us with an atomic bomb, all we had to do if we were in a classroom is put our hands over our head and duck under our desk and we would be safe. And that is as absurd as it sounds, and it is absurd, it was a measure of how afraid the American public was. And Joe McCarthy, better than all the people, all the anti-communists who came before, understood that fear and played to it with his simplistic notion that all we had to do was clear out the spies at the State Department and at the Voice of America and at the government printing office, and we would be okay. A few minutes ago, you suggested that the press had a role in this. Uh, McCarthy uh, famously knew how to manipulate journalists uh, maybe better than anyone who had come before him. And I think maybe it's arguable today whether some people have learned those tricks better than he did. 
Um, but talk to me about that. How did he master uh, the art of manipulating reporters? So can I tell you that by telling you a story about the launch of the crusade, which I think gives a sense of just how good he was at understanding the rules of the press and bending those rules to his purpose. And what I want to take you back to is a night, February 9th, 1950. And that is Lincoln's birthday. And anybody who knows uh, what goes on in Republican circles across America on Abe Lincoln's birthday will know that Republicans get together partly to boost their spirits and partly to boost their coffers. And they have this famous Lincoln's Day dinner. And if you're a prominent Republican, you get invited to places like New York and Boston, like Chicago and Washington. When you're Joe McCarthy, you get invited to a place like Wheeling, as his staff referred to it, Wheeling West by God, Virginia. He shows up that night in Wheeling, West Virginia, carrying a large briefcase. And in that briefcase are two speeches. One is a snoozer of a speech on national housing policy, which happened to be something that Joe McCarthy knew a bit about. But Eileen, if he had given that speech that night, you and I wouldn't be here talking about him 70 years later. Instead, he reached deeper into his briefcase. He pulled out speech number two, and that was a barn burner of a speech. He held it up in his hand, and he said, I have here in my hand a list of 205 spies in our very own State Department. They are traitors. They're people that President Truman should have known about, and that's why we're unsafe. He understood a number of things. One is he understood in terms of the public and the press that if he did something different than what most people, most of the anti-communists of his generation did, they said there were traitors in the State Department. Joe McCarthy knew if he put a number to that, and if he said, I, I have the actual names, that that was in his cowboy style the way to get the attention of the journalists. But he also knew better than to release that speech and that claim in Washington, D.C. He picked a burg like Wheeling, West Virginia, because he rightfully predicted that the only reporters who would be there that night were one person from the Wheeling Intelligence or newspaper, somebody else from the local radio station, and an AP reporter who probably didn't know where Washington was. And he knew that they would have no clue who to call for comment on the charges he was making, which is just what he wanted. He knew also that even if they knew who to call in Washington at the State Department, that if he gave the speech as a dinner speech and they would have five minutes before their deadline, they wouldn't have time to call anybody. So his story made page one of the local paper the next day. Two days later, it was in every newspaper in America on page one, and he was off and running, off and running with his crusade and off and running with his capacity to play the press by their own rules in a way that assured his stories almost never had the other side, that that showed up on page 24 the day after his page one story. Well, it's fascinating. I don't know about you, but um, I started my career in a paper called the News Times in Danbury, Connecticut. And I know that my editor would have said, give me the list. How did reporters manage for quite some time, even after he left Wheeling, West Virginia? Your book tells us he made a cross-country trip in which he held up lots of pieces of paper and the number of spies in the State Department changed depending on what town he was in. So it was extraordinary. The number was sometimes 205, sometimes 207. And my favorite number was 57. And my theory and a pal of his theory is that he stopped off for a steak on his way to his dinner that night. And he used Heinz 57 sauce. And that was just one of the many numbers that stuck in his head over that next week. But what happened was, Every time a reporter would challenge him and say, we want to see that elusive list, he would say, oh, I left it in the plane. I left it in my briefcase. I don't want to show it to you until I show it to the White House and the State Department. He had a different excuse, and the reporters bought it for two reasons. One is because they were so enamored of this senator. These were reporters from Wheeling, West Virginia, Reno, Nevada, 
places that weren't used to seeing U.S. senators and getting to talk to them. But the other is, there was an unwritten rule. We don't ask questions that are too tough. And Joe McCarthy, you will keep putting us where every reporter wants to be, which is in the center of page one. And he did that for four long years with some of the best reporters in America who made sure not to ask him questions that were too embarrassing. Well, that doesn't make our profession look too good. Uh, but it was not only reporters that were complicit. I think you make a great case that there were a lot of his Republican colleagues who were horrified by Joe McCarthy. Um, and you particularly cast a shadow on President Eisenhower, who thought he was a bully and who thought he was making a lot of this stuff up, and he didn't take him on. Why he not? Didn't. So it's easier to say why his Republican colleagues didn't. And his Republican colleagues watched the first senator who challenged Joe McCarthy, a guy that nobody remembers today named Millard Tidings of Maryland, who was a long-serving senator and whose son became a senator from Maryland. And Tidings, I remember him, Larry, because Eunice lived with him for a while when she first moved to Washington. Ah, so there Continue. is... So one of the things that people will come away with tonight, not just because it's at the Kennedy Library, is the sense that there is a Kennedy connection to everybody, <laughs> from Joe McCarthy to Miller Tidings to everybody we'll talk about. And with his fellow senators, what happened with Tidings is, Tidings was the first one after that famous speech in Wheeling that stood up and said, Joe McCarthy, you are a fraud and a hoax. And he was right, but for his troubles in that early 1950, when he stood up and tried to expose McCarthy, that November, Tidings was greeted by a Republican know-nothing opponent who was financed by Joe McCarthy's wealthy oil tycoon backers, who was lent staff and a bag of dirty tricks by Senator McCarthy, and who was taken down to defeat. And the message got through to every other senator, you take on Joe McCarthy at your own risk he is a steamroller. He has no ethics, but he has great politics. That's not what happened with Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower watched Joe McCarthy savage, and I mean really savage, one of Eisenhower's closest friends from his World War II days, a guy named General George C. Marshall. McCarthy said that Marshall was at the center of a conspiracy of communists, it was a, the most ludicrous of all of his charges. Eisenhower obviously knew that, and he had a speech when he was campaigning for president in 1952. He had a speech that he was ready to read, attacking McCarthy, condemning McCarthy. His aide said, we might need Wisconsin to get the nomination and win the White House. Famous, the, um, it was a, um, a toss-up state then as it is now, and Eisenhower backed down. Eisenhower, in one of, I think, his biggest regrets as a public figure, did not defend his pal, uh, George C. Marshall. The day Eisenhower took office in 1953, Dwight's brother, Milton, started whispering in his ear, saying, give up some of your popularity, take on that bully, McCarthy. Eisenhower's response to his brother and to everybody else who advised him that was we will wait for McCarthy to do himself in. Now that might have seemed like a cautious general doing the smart political and strategic thing, and it would have worked, and it did work that McCarthy did do himself in. But the bad news is in the year and a half that Eisenhower waited, lives were ruined, careers were smashed, and people were silenced. And so I think despite the fact that smarter historians than me have defended Eisenhower and called what he was doing his hidden hand approach, exercising the power behind the scenes. I think it was his empty glove approach and that Eisenhower was in fact McCarthy's enabler in chief. Well, it wasn't only Republicans that were uh, McCarthy's enablers in chief. We are at the JFK library, if only virtually. And uh, Joe Kennedy was a financial supporter of Joe McCarthy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of Joe McCarthy. Um, Bobby Kennedy 
as you know better than most, worked for Joe McCarthy. So tell us how that happened. I mean, we know it was a period of anti-communism that was not, was bipartisan. Everybody was anti-communist at the moment. Uh, but tell us specifically how he wound his way, this farm boy from Wisconsin, uh, into the hearts of Hyannisport. So I want to put in one more pitch for Eunice as a character, and one of the only Kennedys that had the good judgment to say that Joe McCarthy is not somebody she wanted to date, even though he was interested in her, was Eunice and her sister Patricia and her sister Jean, all three of whom, um, even though there was a wild age difference, were people that McCarthy had set his sights on. But the fact is that Joe Kennedy thought that Joe McCarthy was a whole lot like him. They were both fiery Irishmen, they were both proud Catholics, and they both were politically incredibly ambitious. And they both famously said the same line, which is, for us, it is the White House or the outhouse, only they didn't use the word outhouse. And it was, for Joe Kennedy, every time Joe McCarthy came through either Palm Beach or Hyannisport. He loved to have McCarthy buy for drinks. McCarthy played on the Kennedys' barefoot boys softball team. He was a pal of the family. Bobby was the one who had the closest relationship with him among the next generation. And one of the things that drew me to write this book was when Ethel Kennedy, Ethel Kennedy gave me and gave Eileen wonderful interviews for our book. And Ethel Kennedy said something to me about Joe McCarthy that I couldn't get out of my head. And it was that Joe McCarthy might be a monster to much of America, but to Bobby and me, he is just plain good fun. Now, there are a lot of adjectives that I think of associated with Joe McCarthy, but plain good fun aren't among them. And I was intrigued to see this other side of Joe McCarthy. And what that other side was, was Bobby was hired when Bobby Kennedy was graduating from smack in the middle of his class at the University of Virginia Law School. He needed a job. And he did what the Kennedys always did when they needed anything. They go to Papa Joe and say, I need a job. And Joe Kennedy picks up the phone and he calls Joe McCarthy. And he had given enough money to Joe McCarthy that he knew much as McCarthy might not want to take his phone call, he would. And much like, much like Joe McCarthy might not want to do what he was asking, in this case, McCarthy did precisely what Papa Joe Kennedy was asking, which is he gave Bobby Kennedy a great job, the number two slot in his office. Bobby went to work for him. Bobby believed in Joe McCarthy's crusade. And Bobby Kennedy stayed. He didn't stay on the staff much longer than five or six months, but he stayed a friend till the end of Joe McCarthy's life. Jack Kennedy said to Bobby when Joe McCarthy died in 1957, stay away from that funeral. Jack was plotting, of course, from moment one, his run for the White House, and he didn't want Bobby there with a bunch of Republicans at Joe McCarthy's funeral. Bobby listened to what Jack said and showed up at the funeral. But in classic Bobby Kennedy fashion, he had it both ways. He showed up at the funeral, but went up into the choir loft where nobody could see him. He showed up at the graveside service, but went off to one side where nobody could see him. And after the funeral, he begged all the reporters there to leave his name out of the story, saying it would get him in trouble with his big brother, Jack, and they left his name out of the story. And luckily for me, half a century later, one of those reporters who was still feeling guilty about leaving Bobby's name out of the story was somebody I talked to and he told everything that Bobby had done. This is a very long-winded answer. I'm sorry, Eileen, <laughs> but the last piece of loyalty is the man whose library we're at tonight, and that was Jack Kennedy. And Joe McCarthy did Jack a favor that I think gave his career a kickstart that it needed to become a U.S. Senator. What happened was in 1952, when Jack was running for Senate, Papa Joe Kennedy realized that should Joe McCarthy come to Massachusetts and campaign for Henry Cabot Lodge the way Lodge wanted, that in the Catholic community of Massachusetts, that much of which liked 
Joe McCarthy that could swing enough votes to lodge in an Eisenhower clear landslide year to cost Jack his Senate or the Senate seat. Joe was right. McCarthy stayed out. And Jack Kennedy, for the rest of his life, felt that he owed Joe McCarthy one, which is why I think he not only didn't vote for McCarthy's censure, he never told the world how he would have voted for that. Yeah, he did not tell the world how he would have voted for that. Uh, and so it was sort of a coward's way out, you might say, right? The, the, not the, a profile in courage. Not, no, not a profile in courage. And it... It rebounded on Jack Kennedy when he decided to run for president because Eleanor Roosevelt, who eventually did get on board, uh, initially would not support Jack Kennedy because he had not voted for censure. Now, in his defense, he was in a hospital recuperating from back surgery at the time, but he could have given his proxy vote and and censored the senator. There's another relationship I want you to talk about, too. When Bobby did not work long for McCarthy, but while he was there, he ran into the man who was in some ways McCarthy's Fengali. And that man turns out to have been Donald Trump's Fengali as well. Talk to us a little bit about the role of Roy Cohn in McCarthy's rise and fall. And if you could, a little bit about his relationship with Donald Trump. Glad to do both. The, so Roy Cohn was a brilliant, arrogant young lawyer from New York who, unlike Joe McCarthy, actually had a successful track record of prosecuting communists um, in the government. And when McCarthy took over in January of 1953, he took over the very powerful Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. He needed a chief of staff. He had thought about Bobby Kennedy for the job, but he realized that Bobby was fresh out of law school and had no real experience. And the guy to hire was this young, bright guy named Roy Cohn. And Roy Cohn turned out to be a kid who reinforced every bad instinct in Joe McCarthy's bones. He did what Bobby Kennedy said was take him up a, an enormous hill in a toboggan and send him down with no brakes. And it was an exciting ride on the way down and we all know what happened with the crash at the bottom. And Roy Cohn was also somebody that in addition to almost being like a child in terms of being behind the scenes at all McCarthy's hearings, when McCarthy would step out of the hearing room, Roy Cohn, like an unctuous kid, would come in and pick up the gavel and take over the hearing. And Joe McCarthy thought that was swell. And they had a blast. And Roy Cohn had a young friend named G. David Schein, who he brought in as McCarthy's assistant, but more importantly, um, Roy's sidekick. And together, Roy Cohn and David Schein helped create the situation that led to the Army McCarthy hearings and that gave us Joe McCarthy's downfall. But I want to flash forward to the second half of your question. And exactly 30 years after Roy Cohn went to work for Joe McCarthy, he went to work for somebody in New York who was a young real estate executive who was just about to enter this cutthroat world of New York real estate. And this was a guy named Donald Trump. And Donald Trump, and more importantly, his dad, Fred Trump, realized that Donald needed a tutor, that he was not equipped to go into that world. And who better to tutor anybody in the world in the cutthroat ways of American politics than a guy who had been raised as the protege of Joe McCarthy. And who better to bring in to see Donald Trump than the number one fixer who everybody who could afford his advice and didn't have any ethical compunction about taking that advice, everybody hired Roy Cohn. So Roy Cohn taught Donald Trump how to fight dirty. He taught him how to anticipate his enemies and attack them before he was attacked. He taught him how to deal with um, the charming end and the ruthless end of dealing with the press. You name a Joe McCarthy playbook item, and the guy who learned that playbook and knew it inside out was Roy Cohn, and the guy who was the best student of that playbook 
of anybody in American history was Donald Trump. Right. Amazing, uh, 30 years later that you see the entire thing uh, reprised. Uh, the lying. Lying was a hallmark of Joe McCarthy's career. And yet he often got pilloried for things that weren't in fact lies. In your book, I learned for the first time that tail gutter Joe is a legitimate moniker for the senator from Wisconsin. He was a hero in World War II. And yet the press thought that that was just one more lie. Could you talk a little bit about your process and how you got access to material that those of us who have read biographies of McCarthy before have never seen before? So my favorite stash of new materials was, was the personal and professional papers that McCarthy's widow left 60 years ago, shortly after McCarthy died, to his alma mater, Marquette University in Milwaukee. And for 60 years, biographers understandably have been knocking on the door of the family saying, we want to see those papers. Um, the family decided for whatever reason to let me see those papers. And Eileen, you know me well enough to know that it's not because I was charming. It was probably because I was assistant, uh, persistent. It may have been because um, I had as my advocate on this, the daughter of Joe McCarthy's best friend, a journalist named Greta Van Susteren, who was asking McCarthy's family to let me see things. But whatever the reason was, I got to see his papers, which included everything from his love letters to his soon-to-be wife, to all these documents stamped top secret from the FBI and CIA that they had been leaking to him, to, in the case that we're talking about now, to his real-time handwritten World War II diaries. And those diaries, written from the South Pacific Island where he was stationed, show us that McCarthy's official job was as a land-based, relatively safe intelligence officer, but he volunteered for mission after mission, flying planes under enemy fire, very often as a tail gunner. And he called himself Tail Gunner Joe when he first ran for office. Um, over the years, reporters use that as a caricature, and they, um, one of the TV networks actually did an hour-long documentary caricature, caricaturing him as Tail Gunner Joe by naming the film that, and everybody assumed that he was lying. And I think the moral is, if you embellish and outright lie often enough, when you're telling the truth, we won't recognize that. Right. It's the, uh, the little boy who called Wolf, cried Wolf, uh, story over and over again. Um, talk us, to us a little bit about Joe McCarthy's childhood, if you could. Um, this was a kid of enormous promise, but he was really a farm boy um, for whom the idea of landing in the United States Senate must have been really a dream, but nothing he imagined that he would actually accomplish in his life. So that is true. When he uh, finished eighth grade, he decided that that was all the education he needed and he was going to go out and make his fortune. And he made his fortune by borrowing some money from an uncle, buying a bunch of laying hens and setting up an empire that ended up being thousands of hens. They called him in the leading poultry magazine, the boy chicken tycoon. And that might have been his career, except a virus swept through his flock and killed his hens. He then went to work for the equivalent of, um, in Wisconsin, of our 7-Eleven uh, stores. He made his store the most successful in this chain of something like 15 or 20 stores. And he might have become a 24-hour uh, store tycoon, but he decided at a point that he actually did need a little bit more than an eighth grade education. He did something that I find extraordinary and would suggest to me just how smart he was. A lot of people assume that he was a buffoon. He was not a buffoon and he was smart enough that when he went back to high school at age 20, and he was a bit embarrassed about being so much older than all the other kids in his class, he managed to finish four years of high school doing really well in exactly one year and no special treatment. 
He just did it by being a quick study. He was never a hard worker, but he was smart enough that he could manage to do that. He could manage to do okay in law school at Marquette, where he ended up going to school. He, in, he did well enough in law school without going to a whole lot of classes and without doing a whole lot of studying because he would go to his study groups and absorb like a sponge all the things his fellow students were saying. So he was a smart guy. He learned just how to get through with a minimal amount of work. And he also learned an important lesson in ethics or lack of ethics from the first office he ever ran for, which was president of his law school class. And if I can tell that, do I have time to tell that story? I think you have time to tell that story. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so he was running against a really nice guy named Charlie Curran. And they agreed in, the, in a way that would seem inconceivable today that they were going to do the gentlemanly thing, which was they would each vote for one another. It was unseemly that they would have to be elected with their own vote. So they did that in the first round, and it came out a dead tie. The second round, McCarthy won by two votes. And you can guess whose votes those were. It was definitely Charlie Kern's vote, and it was sure as heck Joe McCarthy's vote. Kern confronted him and said, how could you do that? And McCarthy, in a classic McCarthy answer, said, well, I was telling everybody to vote for the best man for the office, and how could I do anything less? Now, the story generally ends there. To me, the more fascinating aspect is that when Charlie Curran's father died shortly after that, one of the first people to pay their condolences to Curran on campus was McCarthy, and probably the only person on campus who borrowed a car and borrowed money for gasoline to go to the funeral was Joe McCarthy. And for the rest of his life, when Charlie Curran told the story about that election, he told it in an endearing way, saying, Joe McCarthy is my lifelong friend. And that was the side of Joe McCarthy that Ethel Kennedy was telling me about, and the side that explains why the state of Wisconsin overwhelmingly elected him twice. So that shows a lot of empathy in some ways. But where was Joe McCarthy's empathy for his victims? Eventually, when you hold up this phony list of phony communists often enough, uh, real names of real people leak out of those pages. And he had no hesitation about ruining people's lives and careers. I mean, I don't want you to play amateur psychologist here, but I think it's the question many of us ask now about the current occupant of the White House. But I got to believe that people asked then when his toboggan finally did hit the tree and it was all over, how could he have ruined people's lives with no hesitation? So I think maybe unlike, I don't pretend to understand the current occupant of the White House, but I think Joe McCarthy was a truly, um, on some level, a decent guy who was just totally tone deaf to the impact of what he was doing. And I want to explain that in two different ways. One is he would ask people after he had spent the day grilling them mercilessly in his hearing, showing no sense that they were uh, had any rights of the accused, calling them that they took the Fifth Amendment, a Fifth Amendment communist, totally ruining them. And he would invite those same people out for a drink at night because he, like the pugilist he was in high school and college, thought that it was all a game. You shook hands at the beginning of the bout, you fought like heck, and at the end you shook hands again and could go out and have a meal together. But I want to tell you about, I had a whole chapter called The Body Count, and I think it's really important to pay tribute to McCarthy's victims. And I want to tell you about just one of them as a way of trying to do that. And this was a guy named Ray Kaplan. And Ray Kaplan was a mid-level engineer at the Voice of America when the Voice of America was building new radio transmission towers to broadcast our propaganda to the other side of the Iron Curtain. And Joe McCarthy was saying that there was a scandal involved. He was saying that we were sabotaging where we were putting those transmitters so they would give a less powerful rather than a more powerful signal. And he was about to call Ray Kaplan before 
his subcommittee and grill him. Ray Kaplan was in a panic. He took an emergency trip to MIT in Cambridge to visit with the engineers who could back him up, only he couldn't find them. And so when he was leaving the MIT campus, he walked out onto the very busy Massachusetts Avenue. He saw a truck slowing down for him as he was coming to the crosswalk, and he managed to walk in front of that truck in a way that was clear to the truck driver and to the coroner that he killed himself, that he was intentionally going to be crushed by this truck. He left behind a lesson, a letter for his wife and young son saying essentially, I knew that I did nothing wrong, but I knew that nobody would believe me. And I did the only thing I felt I could do, I killed myself. So half a century later, I'm writing about Ray Kaplan, but I'm uncomfortable. Like you, Eileen, I grew up as a journalist thinking we had to have real sources for things. And I didn't want to trust what people had said half a century before. So I found a guy who was Ray Kaplan's boss at the Voice of America. And it was a guy named George Jacobs. And I asked Jacobs, was there a cause and effect? Can I do that and be fair to Joe McCarthy, but also pay tribute to what really happened here? And Jacobs said to me something that like what Ethel Kennedy said, I couldn't get out of my head. He said very simply, it was cause and effect all the way. If there had been no Joe McCarthy, we would have today Ray Kaplan. And I thought this, knew, this guy knew him better than anything. He knew what was going to happen. And I saw that in case after case. Um, it's ironic, isn't it, that you know, in the next decade, the man who would go to Voice of America is the man who helped bring down Joe McCarthy in 1954. And I, of course, I'm talking about Edward R. Murrow. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Do we give Murrow too much credit, not enough credit? for the broadcast that I think our viewers probably are familiar with, um, that he aired on CBS with his producer, Fred Friendly, my advisor in graduate school, um, about uh, the duplicity of the charges that McCarthy uh, had been slinging. And he's often credited with being the journalist who brought him down. Overstatement? Um, so. I think I want one from column A and one from column B. Yeah, that I've... on the one hand, Edward R. Murrow himself admitted that he was very late to this story. McCarthy's crusade began in 1950. Murrow's broadcast began in 1953. And he just wasn't around in the early days. And he felt badly about that. On the other hand, when he got involved, he was damning. He went out on all kinds of limbs. I think it ended up costing him his job at CBS that he took on McCarthy with such vehemence and he did help bring him down, but not fast enough. The journalist who I think deserves credit more than any other for taking on Joe McCarthy is somebody that only you and I, Eileen, will remember from that era. And it was the, the most popular columnist in America and the most popular radio broadcaster. It was a guy named Andrew Drew Pearson. And Pearson took on McCarthy very soon after Wheeling. He wrote 60 scathing columns on him. And he actually suffered physical damage one night in a fancy Washington supper club where McCarthy confronted him in the, uh, the coat check room, came up to him, started slapping him around. And if it hadn't been for a famous Quaker peacemaker named Richard Nixon, stepping between the two of them, he would have pummeled him. And instead of pummeling him in the flesh that night, he pummeled him from the Senate floor a couple weeks later when he went after Pearson's sponsors and got the Adam Hat Company to withdraw his sponsorship of Drew McCarthy's, uh, Drew Pearson's radio broadcast. Uh, Pearson had had courage. Pearson had very few friends in the press who stuck with him. And Pearson ends up a very unsung hero today. Would you uh, give a shout out as well to the cartoonist at the Washington Post who gave us the name McCarthyism? So I'd give an enormous shout out. One of the other people who, so two cartoonists actually helped bring down McCarthy. One is, you're talking about Herblock, but the other was the cartoonist Kelly, 
who gave us the famous Pogo um, comic strip. And the best way to attack Joe uh, McCarthy, I think, was to caricature him in the way that both of these cartoonists did brilliantly. And lots of people claim credit for giving us the term McCarthyism. I think it was Herb Locke who deserves the most credit. But Joe McCarthy, in his classic spin fashion, said McCarthyism is Americanism with its sleeves rolled up. He was Donald Trump-like in being able to twist anything to make himself look like a hero. So the pugilist McCarthy, who had empathy for people who he knew, who he savaged and took out for a drink uh, after he had savaged them, uh, brings up the other question that dogs us about McCarthy to this day. He was always a big drinker. How much did his alcoholism contribute to this persona that he created? Um, you looked at his medical records. Uh, which no one else had ever done. And you you must have some sense from reading the transcripts, which no one else had ever had access to, of the closed door hearing sessions about the influence alcohol had on creating this Joe McCarthy persona. So first a word about the hearings. The hearings, everybody knows if they know anything about Joe McCarthy, about the famous Army McCarthy hearings. And those were the most heavily publicized, heavily watched hearings in the history of America to that point. And what we don't know, what we didn't know, is that two thirds of McCarthy's hearings were behind closed doors. He kicked the public out, he kicked the press out, and when he went behind closed doors, we saw Joe McCarthy unhinged. Any pretense of caring about rights of the accused went out the window, but something else that was going on that I could only speculate until I saw the medical records was I thought, and more importantly, the official historian of the US Senate who curated the release of those documents thought that we were seeing a different Joe McCarthy in the morning when he was stone cold sober than in the afternoon when he had had his trademark lunch of a hamburger, a raw onion and lots of whiskey. And mm -hmm. in the afternoon, his fuse got shorter in the afternoon, you didn't want to do anything to upset Joe McCarthy because he would take you apart. And I thought it was the whiskey. But saying that, it's a tough thing to say without evidence. And the evidence is there in his medical records from Bethesda Naval Hospital. The evidence is that McCarthy always had a drinking problem, that after he was censured at the end of 1954, he was drinking nearly a fifth of whiskey a day, and that alcohol, not acute hepatitis, is what killed him. The coroner's report and every journalist in America's report said he died of hepatitis. That simply isn't true, and the records make clear that it isn't true, and they were trying to protect Joe McCarthy and his widow by saying that's what happened to him. But it was a very sad case that explains a lot of his behavior. Right. So, in fact, he drank himself to death, but he maybe drank himself in to the belligerent fear monger that was Joe McCarthy as well. Yes. So that either changed his personality or it enabled his instinctive personality to come out. It would we need a an alcohol expert here with a lot higher pay grade than either of ours to um, sort that out. But it is clear that his addiction to alcohol played a role in his bullying. So we're, we've been talking about uh, a depressing phenomena in American history and uh, one of the great bullies of American history. But ironically, after you've laid out this incredible story, you're an optimist in the end about America and about democracy and about the American experiment. We have a love affair with bullies, but. But thank you, a wonderful setup. And I think that the, um, and now I better hit it out of the park given you the better. way you set it up. And I think that the, so my book may be a biography of one of the most malevolent characters in American history, but it is, as Eileen says, a good news story. And the good news is that given the rope, every demagogue in our history, from Joe McCarthy to George Wallace, to long before them, Huey Long, 
every demagogue given the rope has hung themselves and given the time America, which too easily buys into bullies, given the time we see our way to clarify their bullying and to cut bait with them. And I think that in a moment when we need a good, you, good news message, John McCarthy's story counterintuitively is a good news story. Um, I'm going to let our part of this exchange um, end now in order to give the audience, which we both know from our own experiences, always have way better questions <laughs> for us than either of us have yeah. for each other. So um, Liz Murphy is um, texting me some of these questions. Um, someone asked, what was the relationship between RFK and Roy Cohn? Um, so I'm not sure what a strong enough word is to describe that relationship. It was a kind of hatred that had everything to do with everything about who each of them was. Roy Cohn was a kid from relatively, not real modest, but relatively modest means from New York who felt like he had risen on his own. Bobby Kennedy was not, and he was a Kennedy. And Roy Cohn resented him for that. Bobby Kennedy, um, Roy felt, was also an anti-Semite. And I think that is too strong for the son. It may be true of the father, Joe. But that was, each of them, I think, played out their own insecurities by casting the other as the arch villain. And all that we can say for sure is they hated one another and that Bobby Kennedy for years afterwards would say that the reason he left Joe McCarthy was because of Roy Cohn. And I think that was a fig leaf. The reason Bobby Kennedy, I think, left Joe McCarthy was that he knew, and he may have known through J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, who was a buddy of his dad's, he knew that Joe McCarthy was on his way down. And I think Bobby, for all of his loyalty, wanted to get out before McCarthy fell. Well, this dovetails pretty nicely on that. Um, Roy Cohn, of course, uh, died during, right after the AIDS epidemic, um, himself having died of AIDS, even though he'd spent his life denying that he was a gay man. Uh, there were such rumors about Joe McCarthy as well. Uh, can you talk a little about his marriage to the woman who was an aide of his in his Senate office and whether you explored that part of McCarthy's life at all? So I did, and we always explore everything, whether we write about it or not, and we write about what we have the evidence for. And I want to, before I go to the question of whether Joe McCarthy was himself gay, I want to go to the question of what a cynical and despicable character Roy Cohn was. And one more piece of evidence, or two pieces, is that Roy Cohn was gay, and yet he led McCarthy's gay bashing hearings. And that was called not the Red Scare, but the Lavender Scare. Joe McCarthy, that Roy Cohn was also Jewish, and yet he led Joe McCarthy's effort to go after disproportionate number numbers of Jews in the army and elsewhere. And I think that Joe McCarthy might have been an anti-Semite. A lot of his friends think he was an anti-Semite. And what McCarthy would tell his friends when they asked, why did you hire that Jew Roy Cohn, he would say to protect me against charges of anti-Semitism. Could he have been that cynical? Yes. Would Roy Cohn have let him get away with it, as we saw on the gay issue? Yes. So now to the question that I've been avoiding, is Joe McCarthy <laughs> gay? Was Joe McCarthy gay? The answer is that I have no definitive evidence. What I can tell you is that there were all kinds of charges that Hoover and his minions, um, Hoover himself, who may have been gay, and his minions investigated. And whether they didn't want to look too hard or whether there wasn't the evidence, they always discounted all those rumors. There were clearly rumors in Washington at that time that bachelor Joe McCarthy, who was around cavorting with Roy Cohn and David Shine, that he was in fact gay himself and that he married Jean, his aide and woman who was in love with him and who was smarter than him and who wrote anything that was eloquent that came out of his office, that he married her again as a fig leaf to disguise the fact that he was gay. I don't believe that. And I think they actually had, I saw her letters to Joe, his letters to her in those private files. I saw an unpublished memoir 
called the Joe McCarthy I Knew that Jean wrote and decided that she never wanted anybody to see. And she stuck in the back of those files that she thought were never going to be made public. And I believe that they actually had a very good marriage. And I believe at the end of his life, they adopted an infant child in an adoption ceremony that was probably rigged by the Catholic Church and Cardinal Spellman in New York, because for many reasons, it was unclear that they qualified. But I think that they adored the baby and that had he been able to kick his drinking, we might have seen a different career for Joe McCarthy. He would never have won re-election, I think. And, and this is a long-winded way of saying that I think he actually had a happy marriage and that he certainly wasn't only gay. And if he was bisexual, I saw no evidence of it. It's worth mentioning, how old was Joe McCarthy when he died? So it's worth mentioning in a way that's really sad. And he was about to um, celebrate his 48th birthday. And it was just the, it is the idea that he was that young, that we, partly we look at the picture of him that we would see in the Army McCarthy hearings, and he looked older. And partly we think of this guy as having lasted as part of our early history for a very long time. And the idea that he was in his 40s when he died is again part of the tragedy of his life and death. Um, one of our viewers asks, um, did fear of being branded a communist change the behavior of a generation of progressives? Yes. So I want to say two things about the communist issue. One is it was joked about Joe McCarthy back then, and I think it wasn't a joke, that he could have been dropped into the middle of Red Square on May Day and not have recognized a real communist. Um, he talked a wonderful game, but all the 24 carat spies had been caught long before Joe McCarthy came along. The ones that he did manage to uncover were generally people who had been already outed by somebody else, and they were more likely to be a mid-level union official than a real communist espionage agent. But whatever the validity of the charges, the effect of them was not only to take some lives, to ruin careers, it was to do precisely what the questioner asked, which was to silent a generation of Americans who had anything approaching a liberal viewpoint from feeling free to express that viewpoint. And as we know, and as seems like a cliche now to say it, but I'm gonna say it anyway, as we know, one of the reasons that a lot of people think, and I think that we got into the debacle in Vietnam was because all the China hands at the State Department who could have kept us out of there were cleaned out of the State Department by Joe McCarthy and because Jack Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and a generation of Democrats were trying to show that they weren't going to lose Vietnam and other countries the way Joe McCarthy accused the Democrats of costing America the nationalist China. Um. The, this is a question for, uh, for you about the press from one of our viewers. Uh, has the media become less effective in battling today's political demagogues? So I think the media is equally effective, equally to blame at the rise of a demagogue. The media gave Donald Trump a million platforms to including something that we see in the New York Times this last week where they actually gave him the platform of the show The Apprentice to come before the public, the same way the media was giving Joe McCarthy a platform. The media had people all along then as now who are really aggressive reporters who are batted down and at times put at peril of their own safety by taking on the bully and the media is a mixed picture then as now. We haven't gotten better and we haven't gotten worse. Are there any lessons that we could have learned directly from the way McCarthy dealt with the press and the way that the press responded to him? Um, I often wonder this when I read history is, does every generation have to learn the same lessons over again? Uh, so you and I, left journalism to write history in part because we believe that history can matter and that we don't have to learn the same lessons over again. And yet I thought the 
a week before the 2016 election, I had signed up to write a biography of Barack Obama because I thought the Joe McCarthy story that I had been contemplating was ancient history, that we were too smart in America to ever again buy into a bully like Joe McCarthy. The day after the election, I realized we won't know Obama's legacy until the end of the era of Trump. And I realized that my optimism about our having learned all these lessons was misplaced. So I hope that as we learn the lessons of Joe McCarthy and of Donald Trump, that we will, and whether we as the public or the press, we will make smarter decisions going forward, but that remains to be seen. Well, you know, you wrote a terrific piece um, this week to say, I think to all of us that the repercussions of McCarthy uh, they play out in our contemporary political life, not just at the White House. Could you talk a little bit about the parallel you drew in the piece I read this week uh, about the uh, Senate Majority Leader and, yes. the, and the fight to replace uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court? I will, but I'm going to bore you and our listeners again by telling a personal story. And the personal story is that my second newspaper when I was a very callow reporter was a paper called The Courier Journal in Louisville, Kentucky. And I went there um, and covered a young county commission chairman, um, a guy who I thought was a pr pretty nasty character. And this was a man named Mitch McConnell. And the Mitch McConnell that I knew then is the Mitch McConnell that I see now as the Senate majority leader, and he didn't invent the wheel about enabling a demagogue. Um, the wheel was invented by a guy named Robert Taft, a senator who was the majority leader, a very smart senator from um, the state of Ohio who was called Mr. Civil Libertarian, but he was also called Mr. Republican. And that latter title is what came to the fore with Joe McCarthy. Taft was telling all of his buddies, this guy McCarthy is going to get us into trouble. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a danger. And he was telling the public, listen to Joe McCarthy. And if you don't buy one of his charges, he will straighten us out and he'll come up with another one that shows he's for real. And it was a classic case of not wanting to compromise a very narrow majority that the Republicans held in the Senate back then. It is a classic case today of Mitch McConnell learning from Taft, although McConnell, as I saw back when he was a young county commissioner, had this stuff instinctively. He didn't have to learn from anybody, but he's doing exactly the same thing that Taft did in enabling a demagogue that he knows is a demagogue. It's a stunning parallel. Um, so the um, one of the viewers has noticed that as we talk about bullies, contemporary and historical, that were starting in the 1930s with Father Coughlin and Huey Long. Uh, this viewer, listener, asks, earlier in American history? Yes. So earlier in American history, um, there were people who stood up and shouted using the media megaphone of their day and whether it was Thomas Paine standing up and just shouting to a crowd and maybe having leaflets to hand out. From our earliest days, politicians have shown that they could be bullies. And I, in my book, trace a dozen of them who came before Joe McCarthy. A lot of them were racists who were in the Senate before and after the Civil War day and into Reconstruction. It's there anywhere that you look. And I think that the that is what is scary to me, that we thought, or I naively thought, that this may be something that we could say about the history of Italy and France and Germany and Russia, mm -hmm. but certainly not in the United States of America. And as you point out, and as James Fenimore Cooper pointed out, in many ways, a democracy makes it easier for a demagogue, they don't have to capture power. They can just run for office and say outrageous things and have us elect them. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, listener wants to know, what was it that drew you to McCarthy? Uh, this is somebody you just described as, you know, one of the most malevolent characters 
in American history. And as you and I both know, when you undertake a biography, you don't have to love your subject, but you have to know that you're going to be living with them for a few years and that they're going to live in your head for a long time thereafter. So why McCarthy? Why? So I would never have taken on this book if it wasn't in the era of Donald Trump. And this was my way. And if um, Eileen, you're a great psychologist and you wrote a great book about psychology. And I think that the um, it is maybe my way of trying to understand an election that I found very surprising. And I thought, and I proved to myself, if nobody else, that to understand Donald Trump, we had to understand this long strain of demagoguery in America. And we had to understand particularly this guy who had the flesh and blood connection via Roy Cohn to, John, uh, to uh, Donald Trump. And I think that the, and I felt like when I was writing this book, that every day, and I mean this literally, at times I couldn't quite remember whether I was reading that day's newspaper or the newspapers about what Joe McCarthy had done 70 years ago. Um, I kept Donald Trump's name out of my book other than in the preface and in the epilogue, but one could argue that he was there in every page of the book. And I think that we're always looking to understand our history better, but we're looking to understand it in a way that starts with who we are today and what aspect of our history we think we have to understand. So when you wrote a brilliant biography of Eunice Kennedy Shriver, I think that you wrote that partly in having us understand where the whole disability rights movement came from. Every biography is using one person's story as a lens into a much bigger story. Bobby Kennedy, in my mind, was a book about how America changed from the 1950s to the 1960s, and Bobby Kennedy was a cutting edge of that change. Eunice Shriver's story was not just a story about this fascinating Kennedy woman who was overlooked for too long, but a story about an entire civil rights movement in America, the disability rights movement, told really well by you. Joe McCarthy's story, as the title of my book suggests, is a story about this whole issue of demagoguery from our start to today. Well, you tell a wonderful anecdote in the book that speaks right to this echo that you hear. You say as you were writing, sometimes you couldn't tell whether you were writing about Donald Trump or Joe McCarthy. And that anecdote involves uh, Donald Trump saying during the 2016 campaign, that he could take out a gun and shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and he wouldn't lose any of his voters. And it's extraordinary to think that that, that isn't a unique perspective, but you did hear an echo from the past. Could you tell us about that? Yes. So whatever a stronger word is than echo, I felt like I was reading the same thing. So Eileen just um, remembered well the quote possibly the most famous quote that Donald Trump uttered in the 2016 campaign. I want to read you another quote. The, this is a quote from exactly 62 years before that. And it was a quote penned by George Gallup, the father of polling. And what he said about Joe McCarthy's supporters was, and I quote, even if it were known that McCarthy had killed five innocent children, his supporters probably would still go along with him. And I think it is a chilling echo, but it is also, it suggests to me, we talked about enablers, we talked about fellow senators, rich people who underwrote the finances of Joe McCarthy's campaigns and Dwight Eisenhower, but the ultimate enabler for a bully is us. It's the public and we're the people who would let Joe McCarthy get away with killing five innocent children or Donald Trump shooting somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue. And we are ultimately the one that's got to fix this. And what is it about those men that they know this about us? So it is about every bully that they have an instinct for this. They get what makes us afraid. They get how they can give us a simplistic answer. Joe McCarthy's answer to everything was just get rid of the commies here and that will solve all of our problems. Donald Trump's answer in his early days to everything was just get rid of the refugees who are streaming across our border. 
They understand that the fear is real. We talked about the fear of communism in 1950s America. There was a fear in 2016 of a very real economic dislocation of a lot of Americans having been left behind. But that doesn't justify the answer pointing to immigrants and saying they're the cause of our problem. So he's not talking about the caravans coming across the southern border in this campaign, but now he's talking about the anarchists and the uh, Black Lives Matter movement causing violence in the cities. And you're saying that's all of a piece. It's a way of tapping into people's fears. So I'm saying that the there was a connection between the immigrant issue and the communist issue. There's even more of a connection today between these socialist blue city mayors as Donald Trump is painting the case. He is using Joe McCarthy's language. This is, all you have to do is say somebody's a socialist and that's enough charge made, leveled, uh, they're indicted, convicted. And I would say that it is um, that Joe, that Donald Trump, every time he's gotten into trouble the last three and a half years, he has said, I wish I had Roy Cohn by my side. What I think he's really saying is not, I wish I had my mentor by my side, but I wish I had my mentor's mentor. Only it's too politically incorrect to say, I wish I had Joe McCarthy there. So instead he says Donald Trump. So I'm sorry, says Joe McCarthy. Right. So it will, uh, Roy Cohen. maybe one day we'll be calling it Trumpism. Yes or no? Maybe. 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 Um, someone wants to know, and it's a good question. Um, What's the thing that surprised you most about Joe McCarthy uh, in your research? So it is that Ethel Kennedy was right. It is that there was this other Joe McCarthy. It was the side that would invite people out to a drink. It was the side that charmed Charlie Curran back in law school after dissing him out of the class presidency. It is that this guy, it's simplistic and cliche to call it Jekyll and Hyde, but it was Jekyll and Hyde. And he was somebody, I don't know that I would want to go out for a drink if I had an opportunity with Donald Trump, but I sure as heck would have loved to have gone out for a beer with Joe McCarthy and to sat down day after day and interviewed him because for all of that evil side of him, he had a side that was the every man, the best side of populism to his personality Unfortunately, that wasn't the side that we saw most often. But had he reached in and picked out that first speech of the national housing policy instead of the speech about commies in the State Department, maybe we would have seen more of the other side. Right. Um, you, you read so often now about Donald Trump by all of the armchair analysts in our profession who are trying to understand this fellow, um, that underneath all of that, bravado and bullying is a very insecure man. Uh, did you see that in Joe McCarthy? So I think you're being polite. And the real word that you hear all the time is he's a raving narcissist. And I think that I didn't see the narcissism in Joe McCarthy. A lot of armchair psychologists say that Joe McCarthy could well have been bipolar, that what they would have called in those days manic depressive, because he had periods where he clearly was down and he had other periods where he seemed so high. Now, I don't know whether it was manic depression I don't know whether it was alcoholism. I don't know whether it is in the way that psychiatrists tell us today that the two often go together. What I can say definitively is that he, his doctors back in the army, one of the things that I saw records of was not just his contemporary records from Bethesda Naval Hospital, but some of his records back from the days when he was in the Marines during World War II. And I saw evidence that he spent time in what looked like a hospital or what he spent time in a hospital for what looked like it was depression and they called it battle fatigue and they called it various names but i think had we been at a point either in the 1940s or in the 1950s where we had really good psychiatric care for senators or for soldiers that we would have had a really good diagnosis but instead all they diagnosed was his drinking problem right 
Um, one of our viewers asks whether you see any parallels between Joe McCarthy and a subject of one of your previous biographies, uh, Ed Bernays, the father yes. of spin. Of course, he, um, he invented public relations. So two words on who Bernays was. He was, as Eileen said, the so-called father of public relations. He was also um, the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And he took his uncle's ideas on why people behave the way they do and used it to reshape the behavior of GM, of GE, of several presidents of the United States. He was the brilliant spinmeister. And I think if Edward Bernays was the father of spin, Joe McCarthy was the son of spin. He understood instinctively how to spin the voters of Wisconsin. He understood instinctively how to spin the voters of America to the point where in 1954, at the start of the Army McCarthy hearings, George Gallup told us that Joe McCarthy's favorability ratings were a full 50%, that one in two Americans thought he was doing a swell job. The only public figure in America who was more popular then was our war hero, President Dwight Eisenhower. And that is extraordinary. And you've got to be able to spin things. If you can't come up with real commie spies, but you can convince half of America that you are, you've got to be quite a good persuader. That's something. Um, well, you're not, you won't be surprised by this question at all because of the venue in which we're having our conversation. Uh, several people want to know if you have any stories about the relationship between Joe McCarthy and the Kennedy family that, you know, might illuminate why they were friends. So I think like everything in the Kennedy family, whether we're talking about Eunice or Bobby or Jack, it all goes back to Papa Joe. And I think that the idea that he and um, Joe McCarthy had both grown up in relatively modest circumstances, neither as poor as they wanted to make out in later years because it added to the legend, but neither certainly having the kind of money they would have later on in their life. Um, they liked one another. They were both great schmoozers and storytellers, and they were both willing to do anything, and I would underline the word anything, to get themselves or their children elected to public office. And I think they shared so much that to the Kennedy boys, and I presume you would say it was true for Eunice as well, pleasing their father was a big deal. And if the kids thought that Joe McCarthy was a great guy in their father's eyes, then he was okay with them. Well, I'll add a story here too that, that underscores exactly what you just said. Uh, when Eunice was a young woman, uh, they had invited Joe McCarthy out to Hyannisport. And they took him out on the boat. And of course, everybody's water skiing. And uh, they insist that Joe McCarthy do the same. Um, he was not all that familiar with water. He didn't grow up on the coast. And uh, when he predictably uh, fell off his skis, uh, was flailing around in the water, Eunice kept dunking him into Nantucket Sound. Uh, until it occurred to someone on the boat that Joe McCarthy could not swim. And so then they hauled him up onto the boat. So I think that's a wonderful story, partly because it says something about the Kennedys um, and the idea of they're being cavalier, but also they're assuming that anybody had to be an athlete like them. And Joe McCarthy, while he was a great boxer, was a terrible softball player and he played on the Kennedy softball team and was benched and he was, he couldn't swim. And he was in the later years of his life, really overweight. And I think that was partly a result of his drinking and it partly reflected that he had just sort of given up on any idea of healthy living. He would do something that I would suggest listeners might want to block their ears when I say this, but he would, as a way of preparing his body for all the alcohol he was going to pour down his throat, he would sometimes eat a stick of butter, which oh. somehow he thought coated his stomach, and it was a sign of his unhealthy living and his drinking too much, but also any stomach that could take a stick of butter, he wasn't feeding it very well. Right. It's sort of amazing given that story, that he made it to 48. Uh, that's extraordinary. Um, well, tell us, can you, if there is a project coming after um, Joe McCarthy? Uh, you, have, you have a habit 
one notices of uh, grounding yourself in the 20th century. And often in the mid 20th century, uh, it's a place uh, that I'm interested to hear why you find as fascinating as you do. Because it's always a little bit about me, unfortunately, and about stories that I grew up in and I'm interested in exploring. And that is absolutely true of the next book. So I get very anxious when I near the end of a book thinking I'm never going to have a topic I like again. And more importantly, a publisher is never going to buy another book from me. And so well before I finished this book, I had signed up with the same publisher for the next book. And it was my reward to myself and their reward to me for spending four years with Joe McCarthy. The book is called The Jazzmen, J-A-Z-Z-M-E-N. The subtitle is How Duke Ellington, Satchmo Armstrong, and Count Basie Transformed America. And I wrote a book a number of years ago about some um, extraordinary black men who worked on the railroad called Pullman Porters. And they told me that someday I had to write two other books. One was about a baseball player named Satchel Paige, and I did that. And the other was about their three favorite passengers, Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie. And I'm finally keeping my promise. That's wonderful. And uh, so can we assume that you are a jazz fan yourself? Because this is your reward. Yes. Fan, yes. Savant, no. I'm, I know pathetically little, but I'm more interested in these guys' stories off the bandstand and their story, the way I think they set the table in many ways for the civil rights revolution by the crowds they played to and by the um, mixed race bands they played on and ran. Um, any Kennedy connections in this book? I'm not sure that you've had a book, that there isn't one, except maybe Superman. I don't know. Ah, ha, ha. Um, so there are lots of Kennedy connections. They were big fans, and um, Ellington and Kennedy had this. It was um, Duke Ellington's actual name was Edward Kennedy Ellington, and so maybe that's the reason, another reason that drew me. But we can always find a Kennedy connection, as you know, in anything we do. Right. Especially if it will bring us back to the Kennedy Library with a brilliant interrogator like you. Ah, uh, aren't you sweet? Uh, well, maybe on that very flattering note to myself, uh, we should <laughs> think about wrapping this up. Um, it's been a pleasure to be with you, Larry. Uh, it's always like just having a conversation in the living room when you talk about your projects. Uh, this one, the timing, it seems, couldn't be better. And if you could leave people in the middle of this pandemic uh, with some note of optimism about uh, how these chapters in American history unfold. And when we're living through them, we often think this is the worst chapter in American history. Um, my students often say this, There's, the country has never been more divided. And I remind them that we fought a civil war. So yes, the country has been more divided. But leave us with something that you took from this experience and your research that will give us all a little bit of optimism. So I want to, on the one hand, offer a caveat first, which is to say Joe McCarthy was never president. And so I don't want to compare what it's like having a demagogue in the Senate and in the White House. On the other hand, Donald Trump never had 50% popularity ratings that Joe McCarthy did. And again, my optimism grows out of what I think is an extraordinary resilience of our country, that we make bad mistakes, but we generally remedy them. And it will be much easier making this case depending on the results in November, but I think that I think we are a really strong republic, and I think we will hopefully get the story right. Well, on that note, thank you all for watching us and sharing in this conversation with us through your questions. And I hope you will come back to the Kennedy Forums because even though we're not live and in person, this is one of the most extraordinary places in Boston and through the miracle of the internet around the world where we can have really serious conversations about our public life. And for that, we thank the Kennedy Library, Larry and I, for having us here tonight with you. Thank you, Kennedy Library. Good night. Good night.